Welcome back to this two-part series of DDB Talks, our video series featuring the brightest minds, most interesting stories and tales of unexpected works from around the world. I'm here again with Keith Reinhardt. We've covered DDB's past and now what we want to do is cover its future. So in April this year, Keith, as you know, we launched an evolved positioning for the network, Unexpected Works, as the modern day articulation of your very famous quote, creativity is the most powerful force in business. So I'd love to hear from you what you think Bill and Phyllis would say about Unexpected Works, and of course, what you say about Unexpected Works too. Uh, Bill, Bill would have been hesitant at first for the reason that he didn't have anything to do with it. And the reason, you know, he was very insistent that he touch everything that went out of the agency, which is why he did not want to be international. How could he touch things in Berlin or Los Angeles? So his, his first reaction would be a little hesitancy because he didn't have anything to do with it. And then we would point out to him that he had everything to do with it. Because the work that made him and his agency famous, that revolutionized the industry, was unexpected. I mean, who would call their car a lemon? <laughs> That's pretty unexpected. It is. Who would say, we're not the biggest, we're only number two? That's unexpected. Yeah. Who would write a headline that says, what idiot changed the Chivas Regal bottle? <laughs> Is that unexpected? I think so, Bill. And all the things you said over the years about the importance of originality and surprise, I think you had everything to do with this, Bill. Then I think maybe you would <laughs> come around. <laughs> Phyllis. She, you know, she her admonition to all of her staff was always do the kind of advertising no one else is doing. That seems to me to be a foundation for unexpected works. Um, but Phyllis would would have said to me, um, "Look, I'm not into the slogans, but if if you believe." that will inspire the kind of work that nobody else is doing, then go for it. Uh, I think those would be maybe Bill's and, and Phyllis's. In the end, they're buying it. <laughs> uh, my own idea is that, um, you know, I like uh, the way Marty frames it as uh, these are unexpected times. And I think that's meaningful. Uh, I also think that it's pregnant with possibilities for telling clients about unexpected results from unexpected works. I mean, using the double entendre, it works. How did it work? It worked way better than we even imagined. And I could see a time when you have testimonials from clients who said, you know, we weren't sure, but look what happened. When they came to this with this most unexpected idea, and we said, "Okay, we'll try it," and look what happened. Unexpected works. Mm -hmm. I, lo I love all the uh, artistic expressions that uh, that have been on social media, and I've been seeing. I, I, I think they're very imaginative and so forth. Now, now you got to make it real for clients. Yes. Yeah, the social executions came from the very talented team at DDB Paris. So um, kudos to them for Absolutely. helping us bring our unexpected works to life. At the 2019 DDB conference in Miami, you had what I like to call your mic drop moment, where you launched into this very impassioned, impromptu speech about the era of digital distraction. And I actually have the whole speech transcribed because I thought it was so powerful. And in it, you said, there's a difference between big data and a big idea between a click and a connection. And that was a couple of years ago. Where do you stand on the role of data, technology, and creativity today? 
By the way, that was an unexpected call. I did not expect the people on stage to call on me. <laughs> uh, but, um, well, I mean, a short answer, I guess, would be I, I'm for all data that and all technology that can inspire and enable great creative ideas. And I'm suspicious of data that pretends advertising can be a science. Bill was so forceful on that. He said, I warn you that advertising cannot be a, a science. He said it would be much simpler if it could, but it is art, it is persuasion, and persuasion is art. So I, data, you know, for example, the kind of data that um, uh, Les Bennett uh, generates in uh, Adam and Eve uh, DDB in London, and he and uh, Peter Fields have come up with these amazing studies that show if a client will invest in emotional advertising, not immediately, but a couple years out or three years out, he will have doubled the improvement of his bottom line compared to those people who stick with activation all along the way. That kind of data is great. That inspires, that would inspire a sale to a client who said, look what your investment could be. You're gonna to have to put up with six months of no improvement, but here's what's gonna happen at the end. And I, I don't know whether uh, DDB is using these studies, but uh, that to me is, I mean, other people are, other people talk about Les Bennett and, and Peter Field and the data that they have provided. Um, if a data point uh, gives us an insight, then that, that brings or inspires a creative idea, yeah, I'm for that. Um, but I worry about the science, that we're turning this art into a science. Mm -hmm. And I worry, I worry that data, because it's so fast, we, we don't have to let anything soak in because it won't. An A-B test will throw it out immediately. Um, and that that's going to prevent a lot of great brand building advertising. Technology, uh, once again, technology enables great creative storytelling. I mean, Pixar, <laughs> great storytellers. And we have had in DDB some great storytellers that have depended and relied on technology, uh, computer generated imaging. I mean, remember Monty the Penguin? I mean, I, I might have imagined that once in my dreams, but I never could have done it. Yeah. <laughs> um, my very first uh, television commercial was for State Farm Insurance, and, and uh, it was really, uh, uh, they, they complained that their logo wasn't uh, uh, bold enough in their commercial. So I said, okay, watch this. And I took uh, a cardboard logo and smashed it into a crumpled mess and then started pushing it out again with the sound of sanding and brushing and hammering and painting. We had to go to Holland to an outfit called Hoopgazink to do single frame animation of each one of these pieces. It took weeks. You can do that in a second with a computer now. Technology, um, you know, a few years ago, uh, DDB in Spain, uh, where the city of Madrid had prohibited uh, demonstrations. So they used hologram and they had demonstrations and they changed the law. Uh, I think uh, technology, some of the work uh, we're seeing now from DDB agencies are winning awards. Uh, I love the um, Camina Contigo from uh, Peru. Uh, they couldn't do the pride parade, so they did it. 
with technology and it's powerful. Mm. And I, I even got an insight from their uh, line at the end of the commercial. If I remember it right, it's technology can make us humane. Mm. Interesting. In right. their case, they did it and they, they proved it. And that, that spot they did was also a great example of creativity and humanity. In that case, even creativity for humanity. So, yeah, if technology is used, what bothered me about the digital disruption was that it was about a tool, many tools. And it reminded me of uh, one of the American philosophers who at the turn of a 19th century, I guess, said, I fear that men have become tools of their tools. He was talking about the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> and I feared that we were becoming tools of our tools. We did some stuff just because we could. And that use it as a tool, but don't let it distract you from the basics, the human insights that lead to great advertising. So I don't know if that answers your question. I guess it depends. I'm all for it if it inspires unexpected works. <laughs> mm. And I'm suspicious if it's busy about creating a science. Yes. A multi, uh, whatever, micro marketing and all that. Mm. I want to touch on what you said about creativity plus humanity, which has always been the DDB value since the beginning, which is now turned into creativity for humanity is more of a widespread industry trend. If you look at the recent campaign you yeah. were speaking about, but also if you look at the campaigns that won at Cannes this year, a lot were around purpose and, and doing better for the world. What's your view on advertising for good as someone that has done a lot of work in this space? Well, I think, uh, once again, going back to Bill, uh, those of us who professionally use the mass media are the shapers of society. He said we can vulgarize that society, we can brutalize it, or we can help lift it to a higher level. And I always thought that if we could, we could do creativity for humanity, uh, for a client, and most of the films we see in Cannes are actually not for clients. They are just for good causes. I mean, the one I mentioned is, is amazing, but it's for a good cause. It's for, and, and the one that, uh, the, the wonderful uh, uh, Finnish commercial, <laughs> what is it, Sala? The coldest, yes. city, the coldest city in Finland. <laughs> it's wonderful uh, against uh, the issue of climate change. But, we would be at our best when we could simultaneously lift sales, lift spirits, and lift society. And I think, you know, what interests me in that respect is uh, when a client embraces a social issue and then the communications using the client's product or service, and it has to make sense, Maybe uh, one example a few years ago from India for Stay Free. Do you remember that example? Yeah. Taking the, pli the, the client's product mm -hmm. and wedding it to an issue which brought social good. That is where I'd like to see more clients go. And what about your view on the industry landscape? So things have changed a lot since Burn, since DDB was founded. Uh, we've got mass consolidation at WPP. Maybe they could take some of your lessons about mergers and how to do them successfully with what's going on with them. And we've got publicists embracing Power of One. We have Accenture buying Droger and other, you know, really successful agencies. Who do you think is getting it right? And what are your predictions in this space? It's a big question, I know. <laughs> well, the, again, the short answer is whoever's getting it right will be that organization that creates the best environment and the best culture for creative. And I don't think that's the prime motivation for 
a lot of these uh, things you mentioned. I mean, um, for example, um, what's uh, what's Martin Sorrell's uh, monks thing? Media monks. Media monks. And he says in his literature or his press releases, six thousand digital first experts. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll see how that works. But what happened to insight first? What happened to idea first? What happened to consumer first? Um, digital first, let's see how good those 6,000 digital first experts are. And the metric here should be how good is the creative that comes out of that environment? Mm -hmm. And so far, history has not shown us great examples of, let's say, people who decide to take it in-house or even a consultancy who buys a creative agency. Can that creative culture survive and grow within the larger environment because the consultancy culture is quite different than the creative culture. So we'll see. But the metric should be who comes up with the best culture as opposed to who comes up with the most efficient cost savings or, or, or even a definition of efficiency that might not really fit with unexpected works. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about the culture. Who which one of these ideas? And, and the industry will form and reform continuously. It always has. So we'll see all of these things. And we'll say, okay, it's got to be the end of There's a mini trend now. In, it's independent agencies. Those are the people. I, I could give you a list of independent agencies who are not turning out anything you would want on your reel or your portfolio. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Let's see who builds the best environment that attracts the best creative people and, and puts them in a situation where they can do their best work. Talking about environment for creativity, I know that you meet with interns in our US office when you can uh, that are coming in to get some work experience. What advice do you find yourself giving them and the next generation? <laughs> they had some really good questions. I think they're going to be okay. I think they're going to do good things. Uh, when they asked the question about advice, I, I, the, the first thing I said, if if I had given, if I had a chance to give myself my 20 year old self advice, uh, I think it would be network, networking. I grew up in a provincial situation where you were told find something learn to do it well and mind your own business. And, yes. and that's how I grew up. And it was only later I discovered, wait a minute, I could meet all these other people who have great ideas and we could have a conversation and I would learn from them. And so my first advice to these young people is, you know, be on LinkedIn. I shouldn't have said that because now I'm getting stuff on LinkedIn and I don't. But anyway, be on LinkedIn, build a network and and listen to what these people have to say and find possibilities of putting things together. Because creativity, after all, is nothing more than finding new relationships of things that existed before, like burglar and <laughs> um, so my first advice was network. Um, my second advice was, I think uh, the best way to put it is action beats deliberation. I mean, you can set out with a career plan that goes in a straight line, but that's not the way it works in real life. Mm. Um, so don't sit there and over plan. Take the job you can get. You'll learn from it. And that'll batch you up. I saw in uh, Adweek... Um, Last week, I think, 
a CMO from uh, a skincare company or something. She said, your career is not a str is not straightforward. She likened it to a pinball game where you go from thing to thing and eventually you come out where you want to be. And that certainly was my story. I mean, it took me 10 years of bouncing around from thing to thing before I got my first job in an agency. So that was my second uh, advice I shared with them. Um, have a, you know, you have a path that goes like this. The universe has one that goes like this. <laughs> yeah. and, and learn from each one of those ups and downs. And the last one was creative achievement in my uh, opinion and experience uh, has a, three ingredients. One is talent, which God gives you, and you either get a little or a lot. There's nothing you can do about the size of your gift. The second is skill, which you can do something about. You can go to school, you can practice and practice and practice and get good at that. But the third and most important is passion. And there are people out there with way more talent than I could ever imagine who didn't have the passion mm. apply it. And, and the passion is, again, in my experience, expressed in in three ways. First, curiosity. I, I want to know, Einstein said, I want to know everything about the universe. I want to know how the universe works. And he said, I don't have a special talent. I just have this insatiable curiosity. Mm. Second is enthusiasm. Be enthusiastic. Uh, Vince Lombardi was the legendary coach of the Green Bay Packer football team, American football. And he used to say to his players, any player who is not fired with enthusiasm will be fired. <laughs> enthusiasm. <laughs> and uh, finally, his persistence. Hmm. And determination. To take that passion, it's not going to work the first time or the second or the third. Don't give up. Persistence and determination are omnipotent. So that would be my advice to young people. Mm, I think that's all really, really great advice. And we are coming to the end of our time together. So I want to finish on a passage in your book that I love that actually describes exactly what you were talking about in the book, Any Wednesday describes how passion is often more important than talent, as you've just said, and it finishes with this line, we as individuals will create the DDB that still does not exist. DDB will become what we passionately believe in and desire. So I really want to finish on your hopes for DDB now and into the future. Mm. Well, my uh, hopes, and I, I think would be uh, more a prediction that uh, DDB will uh, rise uh, to creative prominence, maybe even creative dominance of the industry under the leadership of Ari and Marty and the teams in all the regions. Uh, very impressive, the potential there. Um, but what my hope would be to be redundant and repetitious is that in every market, DDB has a presence. The most passionate, talented people in that market would kill to work at DDB. Mm. Why? Because they covet a unique, creative culture that not only inspires them, but rewards them and allows them to do the best work they'll ever do in their careers. That would be my, my hope. That's beautiful. I think that is a beautiful sentiment to end on. So thank you so much for joining me, Keith. This was an absolute pleasure. And you've been listening to DDB Talks. We'll see you next time. <laughs>